their perspective, I would say. Um, okay, so these are some of the people in Connected Conservation. Um, and our core group is Malvern, Bill Langbauer, who helped to discover the sounds that elephants make to communicate by infrasound, very, very low frequencies that go through the ground. Um, Andrea Presoto was my PhD student in geography, and she now is a, an assistant professor at the University of Salisbury in Maryland. She, her background is um, behavior of monkey groups in Brazil. She's from Brazil. Um, using geospatial techniques, and then she transferred that information to elephants. Um, so she's a behavioralist, I would say. Um, myself and Dr. Farrell Osborne, he goes by Loki. He lives in South Africa, and he has really been the person who, um, he and Malvern, to get connected conservation together. And then we have a number of um, local people who, um, young, young men who work with us, um, do a lot of the field work and also Roger Perry in the bottom corner <clears throat> he works for Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust he does the darting when we need to put a GPS collar on the elephants um, so it's a great group of people we have gone there um, 2017 2018 and 2019 but uh, 2020 and 2021 we were not able to so we're excited to go back in August and uh, do more field work. Uh, try to go every year if we can. Um, okay. Oh, there we go. And I'd also like to acknowledge the um, faculty and students and postdocs who work in um, our center, the Center for Geospatial Research. Very collaborative, very multidisciplinary, and most of the work that I'll be talking today has been done by many of, of these people. So I want to acknowledge their contributions. So, um, so my objectives um, is to understand our, of our group, our research is to understand elephant movements and linkages to uh, urban development, local communal farming, and also climate change. So there's been a lot of um, years of drought, the dry season um, lasting longer, and the wet, the rains coming later. Um, so all of that is, um, those are all driving factors um, in human-elephant conflict, and we'd like to understand them, so hopefully we can mitigate or, or lessen those impacts. Um, we use geospatial technologies, remote sensing, photogrammetry, and geovisualization, and then also analysis of the spatial-temporal patterns of the animal movements and how they interact with their habitats and the habitat conditions. Um, and ultimately, we hope to help decision makers um, to, we, we know the economy has to grow. We know tourists come to this area. Victoria Falls is very famous. Um, but how can we do that and try to allow the elephants to be able to move where they need to move? Um, and so um, I'd also like to stress something that um, I think is not talked about a lot. It's um, really my background is uh, image, visual interpretation of imagery, manual delineation of land use and vegetation details. Um, we certainly have to move to automated processes. I, I love that. I love um, geo artificial intelligence or geo AI, but I also think there's a, a very important component of um, understanding images. Um, so I wanted to put a note in automation to remember the power of visualization. Um, seeing is believing and understanding. So we need to understand the imagery that we're looking at, the processing, um, what are the algorithms that we're using, how do they work. It's not just a black box where we throw training sets at it and hope something good comes out. Um, and also, we need to assess the quality of the products from these geospatial analyses. Um, and uh, from image enhancement and classification to feature extraction using geo-AI, like machine learning and deep learning um, algorithms. 
We need to understand the image features before we process so we know which process we need and what's appropriate. We also, it's also critical to assessing the output of the, of the quality um, of our classification or our predictions. So we bring, each one of us brings our own life experiences, our own perceptions, our own values, anything we've ever read, uh, courses we've taken, um, places we've lived, places we've visited, all of that um, is uh, a part of our understanding of imagery. Um, and so we may understand some images better than others. Um, some people say it's called uh, very subjective and then because of that different people will have different ideas about images. But I maintain that all of that is also could be considered as expert knowledge. So you may be the expert in, in a certain uh, aspect. And also that we have amazing brains. Computers are wonderful, but they're not as great as our brains yet. So those are just some things to keep in mind. The motivation for this research, especially of the droughts that have um, driven human wildlife conflict. Um, and so if there's uh, no rains, the, the elephants, all wildlife, they don't have good quality food in the national parks and in the conservation lands. Um, they come to the fields where people are growing corn and, and pumpkins and melons and good food. Um, so they are, um, the one big, big problem is that elephants will raid a crop. They'll come in at night, they will destroy an entire year's worth of income in one night. So um, obviously the people need to grow the food, so, so that is a very big problem. Um, the drought in 2019 um, killed more than 200 elephants in Zimbabwe and maybe another 300 in Botswana. Um, we have one student here in remote sensing, he just finished his thesis, and he was looking at cyanobacteria, which is when um, there's a drought and the water dries up. There are, there are very few opportunities for wildlife to drink, so they go to water holes. Um, if it's very warm, there's a lot of algae that grows, and there is a kind of, of actually bacteria which is um, associated with the algae, which is cyanobacteria, and it's a neurotoxin, which will kill um, elephants, all kinds of wildlife and also people. So that's another added um, issue with climate change. Um, our work also builds on prior studies. So Dr. Richard Fair Hoskin had, um, it was novel at the time, but he um, was doing some work in Kruger National Park because the elephants were overpopulated. And then in the 1990s, the, um, uh, the wildlife management um, uh, procedure was to cull herds. So to de decrease the number of elephants, and this is used in all kinds of wildlife, they would, they would kill, they would get professional hunters and kill the entire family group. Um, they're very social animals, so they couldn't just kill one or two animals. Um, they would really felt it was more humane to kill the entire family group. Um, and of course, that, that is, is terrible in so many aspects. Um, so they were trying to use uh, birth control for elephants, and there was some criticism that um, the birth control would make the, the, the mothers not take care of the babies. So he decided to put GPS collars on the elephants in the 1990s, which was very novel, and we helped him analyze the data. Um, we found out that the mothers and the babies stayed together. They never abandoned their babies. So, um, but unfortunately, the, the uh, birth control was very expensive, so they ended up really not doing that. Another um, body of research that we've been involved with, this is Andrea Presoto's work, Dr. Presoto. Uh, we went down to Brazil and worked with capuchin monkeys who were using tools. Um, they use hammer stones and anvil flat stones to crack nuts that are too hard for them to bite with their teeth. Um, and so we were doing spatial mapping to um, try to predict where this behavior happens. Andrea finished her PhD in Brazil and came to UGA to get her second PhD. 
and she wanted to look at navigation and behavior of um, the monkeys that might translate to another social animal, the elephant. So she, um, she worked on that. Um, my master's student did some work on uh, using the GPS collar data for Kruger National Park. Um, she was looking at um, uh, um, the use of habitat and navigation um, skills as well. She found they navigate a certain way in the territories that they are very familiar with, and then they have a different navigation when they go into new territories. So, um, so she did a lot of sensibility analysis and movement analysis in GIS. Um, and then our other work that is um, the foundation of our elephant work is for many, many years, um, I've done a lot of vegetation mapping from high resolution aerial imagery. Um, for example, we work with the National Park Service in the United States, and we did a vegetation inventory of Everglades National Park, Big Cypress National Preserve, Biscayne National Park, and the Florida Panther Wildlife Refuge, which took four years to do. But we um, uh, you know, did a lot of field work and got a lot of experience with image analysis and also um, uh, the effects of hurricane area, different disturbances. Uh, we mapped the Smoke Great Mountains National Park, which is very diverse with a lot of types of forest. Um, and if we zoom in, this is the level of detail. We had 100 classes. We mapped down to a half hectare in size. Um, I always like to create hierarchical classification systems so that all of these little polygons can be can be grouped together for analysis in in uh, higher and higher levels or more general levels. So that that type of habitat analysis and vegetation mapping, um, we we have some experience doing that. Um, and then we've also moved into acquiring our own imagery. When we got our first drone, just a DJI Phantom, um, it was just amazing to be able to go out when we needed the imagery, fly where we wanted to, when we wanted to, as often as we wanted to, and then perform um, uh, photogrammetry to use structure from motion or image matching to create 3D point clouds, and then they could be used to ortho-rectify the images and make ortho-mosaics, and also three-dimensional um, digital surface models and, and digital elevation models. So that has really opened up um, our research at a very fine scale of detail. Um, and then you can add multispectral sensors, like the Microsense five-band sensor, um, but also now we have bigger drones that will carry LIDAR units and um, thermal, um, thermal imaging and, um, and, and uh, we are hoping to acquire a hyperspectral sensor very shortly. So uh, a lot of possibilities for that. Um, create some very nice 3D visualizations of, and this is one of the buildings on our campus. Um, and 3D visualization is very important for not only understanding a landscape in three dimension, but also communicating to others. So it's a good science communication tool as well. We are venturing into virtual reality and augmented reality, um, another way of not only understanding our environment in three dimensions and four dimensions, but also um, that wow factor. Uh, I think um, I'm old enough to remember when we got our first color television, and it was just amazing to see things in color. Um, I got that same feeling the first time I, I tried virtual reality goggles or augmented reality. Um, so um, uh, get anything that gets people excited about looking at the environment, understanding how things are related. Um, getting the attention of students, so we're, we're incorporating it into our classes as well. Um, and it can be everything from computer science, from, from programming, um, to um, seeing how people react differently to different environments or different um, teaching instruction. Um, there's also the human factor. Um, I get headaches when I do this. 
And so the technology may be wonderful, but if, if uh, people get motion sickness or they get headaches, um, we need to solve that problem. So that's, a, that's another area of research in this. Um, uh, this is Sergio Bernardez. So he's the person in my lab. He's the associate director of CGR. He is um, uh, driving this. We have a video wall so that he's, he is seeing this three-dimensional view of the city on top of the table. But if you don't have enough headsets, not everybody can experience it. So he's connected it to the video wall so the class could be there and everybody can see what he sees at the same time. Um, so getting to our, our study area, um, this is the, the, the broader area is called the Kavango Zambezi Trans Frontier Conservation Area. So it's a, it's a coalition of national parks in five different countries um, centered on Victoria Falls, which is a, a wonder, a world uh, heritage site and wonder of the world. And you can see these countries all almost come together at this one point where the falls are. And Victoria Falls is a tourist destination, um, so there's a lot of pressure for more housing, um, more services, um, a wide range of different uh, levels of tourism. There's also mining that's going on, so um, you know, and local people are are, are um, trying to have their own livelihood. So it's a it's a very complicated system with a lot of wildlife um, here. Um, but it's also a very exciting place to work. So um, my geography of Africa was not so good. Yours is probably much better, but um, just showing you, this is considered South Africa, um, not just the country, but this, this, this group of, of countries. And so right in the middle, this is Zim Zimbabwe. And if we zoom in right in the corner where Namibia and Botswana and Zambia and Zimbabwe all come together, this is our study area. So um, this is the Zambezi River, and there's the falls right there. And because of the, the geology and the way the erosion happened, the falls have been receding. It's, it's a fascinating area. So you can see the liniments of the faults. Um, this feature right here is the golf course. So there's a lot of very high-end hotel, uh, hotels and resorts. Um, you cross the border, and this is Zambia, so this is Zimbabwe on, on the west side. And this little area right here, this is Victoria Falls. It's not a very big city, um, no high-rises or anything like that. But this whole general area is considered the Victoria Falls area. You can see these little fields. These are all farmers' fields. This is communal lands, so there are a number of tribes that have... Um, jurisdiction over this area and their livelihood is by crops and cattle. Um, this is the airport. These um, forested areas are preserves, so some of them are private preserves that are used for hunting or to have tourists come and see wildlife. Um, so, and, uh, and, and the, the vegetation changes depending on the wet season or the dry season, so it's just a fascinating area. Zoom in a little bit more. Um, you can see more details here. So this this uh, vegetated area, this is the, I would say, the um, higher socioeconomic level, the people who live there, also older houses, but they have irrigation, and so they have fruit trees, gardens, and you can imagine any kind of wildlife loves to go there and eat the fruit. So the, the, the elephants come right into town. Um, the commercial area is very small, just this in the main street right here. There are some hotels and restaurants and services. Um, there are um, uh, companies that help with um, helicopter rides to see the falls or bungee jumping or zip lines or things like that. Um, local people mostly live in these neighborhoods and this is all new growth. This is where we stay when we go. And you can see so there's some more roads that have been built, and, and this is an area of new development. Um, so it's changing all the time. Right here at the bottom, you see some dark water bodies. That's the water treatment plant. And also right here is the, the um, landfill where all the garbage comes. 
Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about these different places. So I wanted to show you in an image where they are. Because the elephants go through, go everywhere. They go all over this area. So here's an example of when an elephant comes to the field and is raiding the crops, they call the National Park Service and rangers come and they are, they are allowed, they are permitted to kill the animal, the problem animal. Um, they will um, butcher the elephant, they will share the meat, so um, it doesn't go wasted, um, it helps the people, the local people, but you can imagine there will be just another elephant behind this one, so it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, they, they, they cross the border crossing into Zambia, the elephants just go into the road. There was a horrible accident two weeks ago where three elephants were killed by a tourist bus that smashed right into them. And at far distances, the color of the elephants matches the color of the road. So you can imagine that's, that's difficult. Um, on the right side, this is one of our bulls. He has a GPS collar, bull two. He was one of our early bulls that was collared in 2017. This is the main street of Victoria Falls, if you've ever visited the area. And he's he is not afraid of people. He just walks down the street. Um, there's our GPS collar. Um, that's the GPS unit. And you can see ahead of him, there's another um, elephant. So Bull 2 has two, three, maybe even four other elephants with him. He's a big elephant, a big bull. Um, if he's not provoked, he's not dangerous. But at any time, um, many, many people are attacked, um, injured, and even killed by elephants every year um, in this area. Um, so our team, um, our, our interdisciplinary team came together to address these problems, these issues. Um, it's, it's just I've been so privileged to be able to be a part of it because many of these people know all about elephants and the issues of um, the conflict that is there. Um, this is Andrea and myself. Um, we're focused more on the mapping, usually, and getting the GPS tracking data. Um, so these are, um, uh, we have collared, actually, now, uh, I think we're up to 19 different bulls. Um, we did five the first year, and you can see that some of them are black and some of them are gray. The gray bull numbers are bulls that are no longer with us. Some of them have been poached. Some have, have died from cyanobacteria. Um, some of them, the collars, have uh, stopped transmitting. The batteries go bad. We, we try to um, catch that before it happens and change out the batteries. So we've been more successful doing that later, more lately. Sometimes the collars just fall off. Um, but we still have a number of them that we are following. And in 2021, we were able to do one, two, three, four of them, and you'll see Bull 2, um, his collar, um, the battery ran out, so he was collared again, and um, he's actually on his third collar right now, so he's somewhat a, a, a bull that we have been following for a long time. Um, our, our collar 11, we were able to um, uh, collar a lion. We were looking for the bull, the bull ran away, and then we um, came across this lion group, so the researchers, we don't study lions, but the other researchers at the Wildlife Trust do, so we gave them one of our collars. So this was one of the lionesses, um, and that's another uh, fascinating line of research as well. So we can track these elephants and see them on cell phones. We have an app that um, shows their positions, and you can see that this bull, we, we pick a particular bull, and you can see that this bull goes all around the outside of town, but will sometimes venture in. Um, they go in town. Sometimes they'll do that at night. Um, they break fences. They drink water from the swimming pools. Um, so we were able to um, bring that all that data into GIS for analysis. Um, and also, um, they, I had mentioned that this uh, landfill, this dump area, they go there and they eat garbage, and they also drink water from the water treatment ponds. Um, the problem with the garbage is um, there's a lot of food waste. They have very um, uh, tough digestive systems, but they will ingest an entire bag of garbage. 
There are batteries, there's wire, there's broken glass, there's chemicals. You can just imagine all the things that are at a garbage dump. Um, so they do, um, we have had one elephant die from asphyxiation because um, a plastic bag got caught in the, in the windpipe. Um, but another concern is they will eat the garbage and then go away from the dump and this is their excrement or their waste. So there's garbage in their waste. And, you know, all the trouble to bring the garbage into one place and then the elephants distribute it out into the environment again. So we were just interested in these images to see if we could quantify the amount of plastic. And you can see there's different colors. Um, there's this, this kind of red-orange soil, which is the result of dung beetles. So the dung beetles are kind of processing the dung and bringing up the soil from underneath. Um, the dung itself has a lot of fiber in it. Um, and then there's blue and white and yellow and, and red uh, plastic as well. So Sergio did a segmentation to um, classify the different colors and patches of, the, of these different classes. Um, and then a supervised classification and merged the segments. Um, he came up with classes of dung, dung beetle, colors of plastic, soil, and vegetation. And then found that um, almost 40% of this pile was actually plastic. So it's not definitive, but it does give an idea of the magnitude of, um, you know, then I guess you would know the biology of the elephant and, and, you know, how often this happens. And maybe it would be very interesting to do transects away from the garbage dump and really try to look at the impact of that. Um, the other thing that we've done is thinking about the, the sounds that um, elephants make and trying to see their reactions to different mitigations. This is work that Bill did with um, Katie Payne and Joyce Poole um, when he was um, uh, working on his PhD. And so infrasound is very, very low frequencies, it, and it's like a, 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 a roar or grumble that we cannot hear with our ears. So they have devised a way of, of recording it and then speeding it up so you could hear it. So we've got these, they're called swift acoustical recording units. We have them located in some areas around Victoria Falls. Unfortunately, the elephants and the monkeys are very good at manipulating them. The elephants are strong. They can tear them out of the trees. But um, we're trying to get some data now. Um, this is Katie Payne. Um, I think I could just show you quickly what this looks like. Um, so, Oh, no, sorry, that, that is, I'll go back. Um, that, that is her explaining what's going on. So I'd rather go back to my, yeah, I'll skip that one. This, this is a recording of them. So this is a visualization of the audio that come from the Swift, Swift grant, Swift units that you could hear. So it sounds like a lion, but that's actually the elephant. And you can hear the background noises. So, oops. So that was pretty interesting to me that, um, um, let me get my presentation back in a good form. Um, they were able to dis, uh, um, prove that there is a particular vocalization that the females give out when they are um, receptive to breeding. They are only in heat for um, four days, and so they really have to attract males to come to them and um, so they proved there was a particular vocalization that the elephants would send out for that. Um, this is an example of an elephant coming to the tree where the swift unit was and just knocking the tree over. Um, they were able to recover the unit and it was safe. It was still uh, attached to the tree. Um, 
this is a, a, an issue that bull elephants especially will um, knock down the trees in, in a savanna area where there's not a lot of trees. This is a, a, and it also um, has an ecological impact as well. And it seems to be aggression and not just to get the food. So, um, so there are some people studying this. Um, I use the data in my classes. So this has really been wonderful. We are sent, Malvern sends us the GPS tracks once a month. And so I have a class that is aerial photographs and image analysis, and they have group projects at the end of the semester. So sometimes they, um, they choose, they have choice of what they want to do, but sometimes they choose to use the data. Um, they have to classify the, um, the different types of land uses and land cover. Um, then they overlay the points. They can generate the home ranges. Um, these are uh, minimum convex uh, polygon um, algorithms. They can calculate the percent of the land use that they're using in the dry season and the wet season. Um, so they can partition it out for different months. Um, these are the different classes. They, there's not a lot of detailed mapping that has happened here. There's some from satellite data. Um, so they would be doing something at a, um, their classification at a higher level of detail. Um, and then, for example, they can put uh, color code the different elephants and determine um, what, what of the different classes do they use, for example, during the dry season. Um, you'll see this kind of funny cluster of blue points. So that is um, bull four, and bull four got be caught behind a fence. So you can see very clearly where the fence is. The strange thing is that there was no fence on the back side. So we always say that this bull was probably not very intelligent. It took him a long time, but he finally figured out how to get out. And then you can see he dispersed in a, in a different area. You can also see the points that go along roads. So they use roadways for travel as well. Um, this would be the wet season. So they're, they're, they found that the elephants are more dispersed in the wet season, and that would make sense because there's more food availability throughout. Um, this is an animation that one of our students made. So we could see the dry season is red, going to the river quite often. Um, and then um, in the wet season, there's more water available everywhere. And also the crops are growing. So there, this elephant is coming to the edge of the crops. Um, may or may not be raiding them, but kind of checking on their progress. Um, we also see them take off and, and go very far, very fast. Um, sometimes that's called streaking. So it's been very interesting for them to try to uh, figure out some reasons for why they're moving where they're moving. Um, I also have another class which is for first year students called the First Year Odyssey class. This is their introduction. They've never done GIS before. So I have them use Google Earth Pro. They can still bring the coordinates in as a CSV file. They can um, uh, attribute them as day and night points. Um, they can bring in different bulls and see how they interact with each other. So that has been um, a really a really nice experience and introduction uh, for these first year students to, um, to research. Andrea has done a lot of um, programming to um, identify corridors and repeated uh, routes. So she has a, an app that she has created that she shares on, on GitHub. She has some publications about this. We're trying to identify the corridors where the elephants use them um, very often for movement. So we can show the, the uh, local government and also developers, if you build a hotel here, you will be inviting because the elephants use this corridor to get to the river, for example. Um, so uh, we have, she has used the same um, analysis is called HREM, Habitual Route Analysis Method, that she does share. Other researchers have used it for different types of monkeys. And Dr. Roberto Sol um, Salmi, who's here at, at UGA, she's looked at her gorilla um, data also from um, the, the Congo area. So um, these are the corridors that we hope will help uh, park managers and local communities to, to understand um, the typical, the traditional routes that elephants are using. 
Um, this is a dry season, wet season again. You can see um, skirting the town and uh, they never go into the golf course because they've got a very good fence and they also uh, patrol that area. This is a, a, a space-time visualization called an aquarium, space-time aquarium sometimes, that I really like for visualization. It's based on the work of Maypo Kwan, who is now, um, she was at Ohio State and now she's um, in, uh, in China, one of the universities, I'm forgetting which one. Um, but it's an idea of having X and Y for um, location on the surface, and then Z is time. Each of these colors is a different elephant. And just looking at this, you can see there's some elephants that are very wide ranging, and then they, they stay in one area. Um, this bull just goes off to a different, and sometimes they go to a different country. Um, you can see number four pacing back and forth, back and forth, because he was caught behind the fence. But you don't really know if they are overlapping in time as well as space. So um, my PhD student, Molly Azami, created this visualization where then you could rotate it and look at it in different areas and you can see a little bit better the patterns and if the elephants are interacting with each other. So that was uh, kind of an interesting visualization. So, so to get to the mitigation, um, connected conservation, and this comes from the idea of um, Dr. Osborne, uh, Loki, um, this is Bill Langbauer on the side, and this is Andrea Persoto. Um, he gives the, the local families enough seeds to grow a row of chili peppers, and each family will take care of that row. They can harvest the chili at the end, um, they can sell the product, but he also teaches them how to dry the, the chili. Um, and hopefully to keep them out of their fields. This is just a, a vegetation fence. It does not keep the elephants out of the fields at all. But we, we all know that chili, chilies burn. They have capsicum um, the oils in them. And so if you can make an aerosol that the elephant can breathe in, um, or if you have a, a, a mash or a wax that it could be rubbed on the elephant, um, the idea is that the elephant will associate the trauma with the location and will not come back. But we don't know how long they might stay away. Um, will they go away for a day or a week or a month? Will they tell their friends not to go near there? Um, does it uh, help to uh, have other elephants also avoid the, the crops? So that's what we're studying now. We're calling it disruptive darting. Um, so we teach um, the connected conservation and their employees teach the local farmers how to make these something like a we call it a potato launcher, which um, will um, have a little uh, explosive, and uh, we use ping pong balls. So they're they're rigid, but they're very small, and you can inject the oil, the, the chili oil, into the ping pong balls, and then um, be in the field at night. Uh, fire the, the ping pong ball at the elephant, it breaks, and then the aerosols would be sucked into their very sensitive trunks. It burns for, we think, about 45 minutes, um, but it's not a, a lasting um, detriment to, to their health or their safety. But they would uh, associate that burning with that location, and then in the future, they can mix the oils with elephant dung and burn the bricks. And so that smoke would have the chili pepper in it. And then also um, that sometimes they put a, a, a string around the, fit, around the crop and then paint it with the chili, chili mash. Um, and then the elephants would come and touch that and smell it and then hopefully go away. So these are some different methods that, um, that are very low cost that the farmers can use themselves. Um, and, and it seems to work. So this is Bull 2. He came into town and he was at um, the Baobab Primary School just at the time when the uh, parents were trying to pick up the children. And then there's these bull elephants eating fruit off the fruit trees. Um, so instead of, um, of killing the problem elephants, they called Malvern. Malvern went there with the veterinarians and they darted him and 
Um, they rubbed him with chili wax. Um, so that was on July 20th, 2018. Um, the next day, he ran off, um, kind of stayed. He went down to the river, probably trying to wash it off. Um, the day after that, he went around the town, and he left, um, and he did not come back to town for quite a time. We have found out that he has actually not been within 250 meters of the school um, since 2018. So that was a, our first um, indication that this might be working. Um, so now in 2021, we had some extra, uh, some additional funding to really test this more um, thoroughly. So there was a, a, there is a large animal, a large bull, this is bull 15. Um, and he actually stays in this preserved private reserve during the day and at night he comes out and he raids crops. He also goes down to the airport, he's broken the fence, um, and you can imagine that is a, a, a huge safety concern because he's on the runway. And they have regular flights that have to come in all the time. So um, so they were ready to destroy him, but we put the, the collar on him and rubbed, this is Malvern, rubbing him with chili wax in his mouth and in his trunk. Um, so we've been following his movements ever since uh, with our app. And then also, um, this is my students were looking at where, where is he during the day, and then where is he at night? He comes down to drink water here. So trying to understand his pattern of movements and keep track of him as well. Um, this is another one, bowl 16 on the islands. There's actually cabins, a little bit hard to see, but there's a building right there. They rent these cabins out. Um, to very, you know, very expensive, and they even advertise that you will see elephants, you know, from your front porch, but at the same time, they are raiding the garbage cans, and they are a concern, so, um, so we're trying disruptive darting and the chili wax application with Bull 16, um, I guess this is an animation, he's coming next to the cabin, very close to it, and he goes over, this is a garbage can, and it stops just as he's knocking it over and he's going to eat the garbage out of it. Um, so he's, he is a problem, and we also wonder, he might have been um, used to people. He might have been a, an elephant that was taken care of when he was little. He's not afraid of people at all. Hey, 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 hey. hey. So this brave person got him to, to go away. <laughs> um, okay, oops. Okay, so um, so this disruptive darting, this is a chili wax, so it really boils it down and makes a, a mash out of it. We're trying it. We've got four or five bowls right now that have been mitigated this way. Oops. Um, and so this data, I gave this data to an undergraduate student, Elizabeth Johnson. She is in a program which is for uh, honor students. It's called um, uh, an honors um, research grant from the Center for Undergraduate Research Opportunities, or CURO. And she made this poster. So this is Bull 2. He, um, he's still behaving badly, so he got the wax treatment, Bull 15 and Bull 18. Um, she located where um, the bull was darted and waxed and then um, made some buffers around it and wanted to see how, uh, uh, what was the, the movement of the bull immediately after being waxed and if he came back to that area. Um, so it's, she's color-coded the points and, and mapped them. Um, this is the streaking behavior I mentioned where they just take off. You can see there's a, a big distance between the points. We have some colors that record every 15 minutes some every hour, and some um, twice a day. So um, she was looking at how they were using roads. So she wanted to see how often they came within 20 meters of a fence or a road. Um, in this case, you can see Bull 15 is just walking down the road. Um, and found out that um, only uh, one to 2% of the time are they actually in the roads. It's a very open landscape. So they can go everywhere. Um, but that most of the, the bulls did not come close to the 
the, um, the actual location of the darting and the chili wax treatment. So um, the green area shows how often they come in within five kilometers, and the yellow is one kilometer, and the, and the orange is a half a kilometer. So, so it seems to be working. It is very labor intensive, but um, you know it may be another another mitigation measure that local people can use. Um, we have, um, we've been flying drones in our own work, and we um, you know you have to work with the laws of the different countries. So we have a, um, a, a company now that has already been gotten all the permits in uh, Zimbabwe. But what we would like to do is to image the, the fields when the crops are at their mature level and then image them again after the elephants have raided um, to subtract the, the two digital surface models to get a volume or a quantification of the, the crop damage. Um, so this is based on some work of my master's student, Shannon Healy. She was working in Georgia here locally looking at um, gardens and trying to create um, 3D uh, digital surface models as the crops were growing to get an idea of their growing height. Um, this is collard greens and um, it's not perfect, but she could uh, find individual leaves and measure the, land, the height and the width of the leaves. Um, and she compared that to her field measurements. So we hope to be doing that. Um, in Zimbabwe as well. We're also using um, some deep learning algorithms. This is convoluted neural networks. Um, one thing that we thought was interesting is we can see their footprints in the sand, in the, in the fields. So we'd like to identify the actual problem bull. Um, so instead of just killing a bull, which may not be the one that was, was causing the problem, can we look at the footprints because their footprints are unique just like our fingerprints. And so what they leave behind has a pattern to it. Um, and so perhaps if we see a certain number of, in fact, this one has these cracks on the edges, um, would we be able to identify which bull it is? So every time we, we dart a bull, we take pictures of the four feet. Um, and um, one of our statistics um, classes was looking at these footprints, um, looking at the shapes of them, and there's actually a um, a company called Wild Track Fit that helps to identify different kinds of, of um, footprints, different shapes. Elephants are just like an egg shape, but you, you know, you know, wildlife has, has a lot of interesting footprints. Um, so they were working with them. Um, but what we would like to do is really identify the bulls that we have collars with, and can we um, can we uh, identify which one is the, is the problem so we can mitigate the right bull. I also have some graduate students who are, um, again, looking at the, the movements of the disruptive darting, um, looking at home ranges, um, the intensity of space that is used by the bulls. Um, and I have another student who's looking at prediction of conflict. So she has locations of conflicts and she's using um, machine learning algorithms to look at a number of different environmental factors and see if she can um, predict the most likely scenario of um, precipitation and temperature and condition of the crops um, and the movements of the bulls. So um, she's working, that's, that's what she's doing for her PhD. And finally, uh, we have a group that's and from statistics again, who's trying to devise an experiment. There are some um, elephants who were, were used in the past for elephant rides, and they don't do that anymore. But these elephants are semi-domesticated. So um, to find different uh, mitigation, the chili, some kind of a different smelly potion, shiny objects, just a plain fence and a control, uh, lead the elephants up to um, some kind of a, a, an award or a food that they um, would like to go to, and then uh, videotape their reactions and try to see their different, um, how, how quickly do they become habituated to it? Are they, do they have a strong reaction to it? Do they go away? Do they, um, 
you know, just uh, play with the, the object itself. So, um, so that we're hoping to do this in, in the future. So, um, in conclusion, our climate is changing and it's causing a loss of food security, displacing people, and increasing human wildlife conflicts worldwide. Um, there is a critical need for your research, your future research, or your research you're doing now um, in your classwork. Um, we need accurate, efficient, and operational extraction of data and information in two dimensions, three dimensions, and four dimensions, which would be time. Um, from imagery, and we hope that the imagery and also results are open access to be shared, um, making use of online processing such as Google Earth Engine. Um, and a, a, just a reminder to trust your eyes and your brain to understand the imagery and interpret the success of your geospatial analyses. Um, and then explore machine learning and deep learning. They are only as good as the training sets that go into them. Where do those training sets come from? Um, many, many times people are looking at images and, and extracting image chips that, that um, are representative of different classes. You need hundreds, if not sometimes thousands, of these training sets to use for training and then validation. Um, the algorithms are self-learning, so it's constantly checking the predictions and the classifications against what you give the algorithm as a validation. And if that validation is not correct, the algorithms are not going to be learning correctly either. So that, that's very important. Um, my wish for all of you is that you take all the concepts and theories and, and that you learn in your classes, all the on your on hands um, learning exercises, projects that you do. Hopefully, you would take them into a research um, uh, capacity so that you could be volunteering or perhaps even paid to do research, um, develop new new ways of, of um, analyzing imagery, um, refine existing um, methods, and then apply them so that they can go out into communities for outreach and education and awareness to help really solve the, the, the world's problems. Um, and uh, it may not solve, but it may assist, and it also may influence development policy. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, I have uh, most of the, the, um, the articles that I have referenced in this presentation um, and I could even add maybe a couple more that I could definitely um, give you this list as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have one question in the chat box and several questions I am getting through my personal chatting. So I will be asking two, three questions to you, which I am also very eager to know. So first question that is in the chat box that how was the elephant human conflict is resolved? Okay, so first, unfortunately, it's not resolved completely, but we do think that um, teaching um, or helping the local farmers to learn how to grow chili peppers and make the wax and how it's effective, um, we hope that that will, that will empower them to do something that is not very costly that they can actually use to protect their fields um, or their local residents. Um, we also um, will be doing some workshops when we go there this summer um, to show them um, if they have, and many do have access to the internet, that they would be able to bring up some of these images themselves, that they would have access to the, the GPS um, movements or results of our analysis. So um, helping them learn um, some geospatial techniques that they may be able to use themselves. One of my, um, my master's students is conducting a LUCIS model, that's a land use strategy um, uh, identification, well, sorry, land use conflict identification strategy, um, LUCIS model. So it's a way of, uh, it's a suitability model looking at um, the developer's perspective. So where are the areas a developer would like to develop? Where are the areas that the conservationists would like to preserve for elephants? 
where is the area where the farmers need to farm? And then you essentially put all of those suitability maps on top of each other. <clears throat> you find areas of conflict, and you also find areas of agreement and areas that may be suitable for one application or one perspective but not another. So we're really hoping that this kind of um, bringing different, the different stakeholders together, looking at maps, looking at the results of a, of a GIS suitability analysis, that they can understand their landscape better, they can understand the needs and um, the importance of, of, um, of uh, compromise, I would say. So how can they uh, promote development but also um, maintain some conservation areas and help farmers to protect their fields. So this is this is certainly ongoing, and I don't know if it will ever be resolved. But um, we have to do something because um, the elephants are just being they're being excluded from their natural habitat by fences and roads and development. So if we do value wildlife, and it's not just elephants. Um, we really have to, we have to be proactive, I think. Great question. I hope we get there sometime. <laughs> uh, so I would like to ask uh, to our students, so any of you have any question to ma'am? You can raise your hand or unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, okay, I have got a couple of questions uh, in my chat box that uh, what should we, uh, see, first of all, this is a very new topic for us, new kind of special analysis that we are learning from you. It's, we have not done anything like this. And uh, we used to do a lot of land use modeling for different other purposes, but not for this purpose. So my question is that uh, if we want to start researching on this topic, what should be our starting point? Oh, um, well, I always recommend, um, you know, just Google. Google the topic, read what you can. Um, there is There are actually groups that are getting together to look at wildlife um, human wildlife conflict and uh, it doesn't have to be just elephants but you know in India you have issues with tigers and um, I talked to a, a student who works who lives in India and works with wildlife he said there are areas that they want to introduce cheetah back they have elephants you know there's um, uh, issues with, with just with monkeys you know there's there's a lot of wildlife conflict in the United States we have bears especially wolves, deer, all kinds. So, so the topic of, of wild, human wildlife conflict is very, very large. Um, and then you're learning, um, uh, you know, if you're learning remote sensing or you're learning GIS, um, uh, that's the beauty of a multidisciplinary approach. Um, take the areas of your own exp expertise and knowledge, think about the the different functions that you have in GIS and remote sensing, look at the images, um, and, you know, really sometimes just getting a group together to talk about the problems. You talk about some um, ideas for, you know, mapping, um, for how to quantify, how to monitor something over time. Um, you know, if you can map land use, you can map habitats as well. So. Um, it's really just kind of trying to connect the dots, and there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of conservation groups that are doing this as well. Save the Elephants, um, there's one in Botswana, um, and I'd be happy to give you some links. People are using bees also. Elephants are afraid of bees because they sting them. So um, people have been promoting putting beehives around their fields and uh, they get to collect honey and they also try to keep the elephants out. So there's just a lot of creative um, uh, creativity, I think, in trying to find solutions. Yeah, this. definitely. And uh, I request you, if some of the participants or from some of the students become really interested and start working on this, I would like to extend, uh, I would like to get your help regarding this. So 
another question uh, another question i have that what software uh, usually you use for analyzing this kind of patterns oh that's great and i really should have been saying that all along we use um esri products so i i started using arc info at the time in uh, 1987 um, so I'm very familiar with it so that's why and we have a site license um, at our university in our in our state so we are, are able to use now ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Online, things like that. Now unfortunately it's expensive you know you have to buy a license so um, a lot of times our, our partners that we're working with and also just some people have the philosophy that you should not have to pay to be able to do this work. So um, Quantum GIS is, a, is the free software called QGIS. Um, it's not the same as ArcGIS if you have uh, you know, really a lot of familiarity with that. But if you know one, you can learn another. So I've been trying to learn QGIS. I use it in my classes. Um, there is a wonderful community of people. If you have any question, you can go on forums, and they have uh, a, a lot of plugins. So if you need to do something, you search for that plugin and bring it in. So, so I would say those are the, the two main GIS programs that we use. Um, for remote sensing, we had always used ERDAS Imagine. Uh, we use Envy a lot. Those are both programs that you have to pay for. So now, more and more, we use Google Earth Engine. Wow. So it's not, it's not Google Earth, because Google Earth, is, you see the images, it's wonderful, you can actually digitize. But Google Earth Engine gives you access to all of the archive of all the Landsat and the Sentinel-1 and 2, um, uh, MODIS, uh, all kinds of elevation data, a lot of... Um, NASA data from um, climate satellites and sensors, so and and also the built-in algorithms. Um, the biggest barrier is you have to know how to program to use it. So um, it's a lot of JavaScript and also Python. Um, I would say the main program that our students are using now is Python, um, and you can actually bypass GIS completely because you can bring data in, you can do analysis, you can map it. So I would say if anybody, I'm, I'm sure all of your students are, are learning Python already. Um, and then they use R code a lot, R for um, the statistical analysis. Um, we're using TensorFlow for the deep learning. Um, that is open source, but also you can do deep learning in ArcGIS. They're, they're trying to, they want to keep their user base. Um, but what they uh, what is nice, what we have done, is we use ArcGIS to get the training sets. So it has a nice way of, of getting all the image chips and, and labeling them. And then we bring them, them out um, and then run TensorFlow, uh, Python coding, R coding, and then the results go back into ArcGIS to, to visualize them. So, um, so there's, you know, all of this is evolving all the time. But I would say those are... There are some software for statistical analysis that's very good, like Geoda. Um, but I would say those are those are the main softwares that, that we use. Yeah. So we use similar kind of softwares, and uh, students more or less are having knowledge of using uh, every kind of software, including the GE. So definitely, if uh, someone is interested, I would like to ask you to extend your little bit of help in doing uh learning more about this kind of habitat problem yeah through special analysis and we have two more questions so uh how can we apply all these applications in cropping pattern in agricultural technology ah uh, in crop pattern um so so one thing that one of my students is looking at is um uh, my, my student kate markham was looking at trying to predict the conflict is she wants to look at the location of the fields and what is what is planted. Um, she seems to, from the movement data, seems to think that the elephants, which would make sense in the day, they are um, under the trees or staying cool. They wait until night and then they come out. But she's trying to see how far in do they go. Um, 
it will actually abandon fields if they just keep getting raided. Um, so as far as pattern, it could be that um, maybe you could even, the farmers could plant something that maybe extra on the edges, you know, to let the elephants or the wildlife eat that. Um, I have heard of that before um, in Costa Rica where a farmer planted sugar cane, extra, extra amount of sugar cane for the monkeys, and then was able to still get their complete crop. Um, now, if it was on a very, very broad scale, industrial scale of agriculture, um, you know, these are these take a lot of manual work. So, um, unfortunately, I don't know if that would work on that that scale of uh, you know um, industrial you know size crops. But but you know what we're working with are, are farmers who have individual very small fields. So that's that's where we're starting. And is there any other way other than remote sensing and GIS to you know, solve this kind of problem? Hmm. Well, um, you know, I, I say that uh, a lot of the work traditionally has done, been done on the ground, you know, tracking the, the people who live there know how to track the elephants. Um, they understand better their behavior and what what they need to do and what are the impacts of wet season, dry season differences or droughts. So, you know, working with local people, I think, is really important and the resource managers themselves. Um, having imagery available online for free, like with Google Earth, um, I think that that is something that you can show people and they can understand because we're on the ground we don't really know there's a river right over that hillside um but to be able to look from above is is very very informative so you're not really doing gis or remote sensing mm -hmm. but just introducing people to um to an aerial view of their area and being able to zoom in you know so um and now you know more and more people have cell phones so they could actually view some of these images mm -hmm. and also mobile devices you can do a lot of this with locating where you are take pictures they're geo-referenced mm -hmm. um you know understanding mm -hmm. that way so um yeah I, so i think you can actually be using gis gps and remote sensing without getting to the mm -hmm. analysis yep. Uh, thanks a lot. And now our student Roshan wants to ask you something. So Roshan, could you please unmute yourself and ask that? Sure, ma'am. Hello, Dr. Madden. Good morning, Hi. Ma'am, uh, it was a very interesting session that I had. I'm grateful that I've attended your session. And I just had one question. Ma'am, what is the scope of this application of this technique in studying the relationship between man and insect, especially focusing on honeybees? As we have spoken about uh, elephants and man, so what is the scope in applying this technique for insects? Oh, um, so <clears throat> if I understand your question, um, kind of, kind of using the same techniques, but thinking about insect populations instead of like a big animal. Is that yeah, the question? Yeah, ma'am. You got it right, ma'am. It's on okay, the insect okay. population. In, um, so coming from a biology background, I'm always interested in knowing the biology of whatever your subject is. Because, um, and, and if you are thinking spatially, you need to think about um, the scale. So what scale, what level of detail do I need uh, in order to study this? And so, um, and also a scale in, in terms of spatial scale and temporal scale and also what what is the biology of the animal so if it's an insect for example it could be an insect that has a complicated life cycle where it actually has to have a human host or an animal host and then that animal has its own movement and biology and needs and foraging and everything else um, what is the what is the food source for this um, if it's an insect, is it a colonial um, insect? Do they have uh, requirements for where they build that hive or that nest? Is it ground or is it in a building or is it in a tree? Um, what is it looking for? Say it was honeybees and they need um, their foraging, um, you know, flowers that they need. 
Well, those flowers have a certain habitat requirement. So then you're mapping that that um, ecological unit, the, the, the community or the association of plants. Um, do they need a wet environment? Do they need, um, is it a hot dry or a cool wet or a rich soil or um, acidic soil? You know, you have to think about the environmental factors and also the climate of it. So um, it's going to be different for every type of insect, but you can certainly do this kind of work. Um, you know, oh my gosh, they, they've got little tiny GPS units sometimes that are put on, uh, you know, like a hummingbird or even an insect that's large enough to have a little grain of sand on them. Um, it could be RFID technology where it's not uh, emitting a location or, or, or transmitting a location, but it's actually when, when that insect would fly past the recorder. Um, and they're all identified themselves. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of ways that you can study uh, uh, insect um, population dynamics as well. So that's that's a, a very interesting application. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, there is one more question. Could I put it, please? Sure. Um, if we enlarge our scale, uh, do this technique have a scope in studying virology? especially SARS for group given the pandemic situation? Oh, I'm fascinated by using this for um, infectious diseases. And the, the scope is, is global, can be global. Um, and our computers can handle the data now and we have the data. So it is fascinating. I work at a landscape scale, but definitely lots of global applications. And in fact, I have two students in my class. One is studying Mars and one is studying Venus. So, you know, it can, it can go beyond the earth. But so with SARS, um, uh, I was reading some papers during the lockdown and, you know, what, is the, uh, what are the drivers of these new emerging uh, viruses um, and the idea that even uh, COVID SARS um, V2 was coming from bats. So then I got fascinated by bats and bats were, and they carry a lot of different viruses. Um, they are a mammal, but they fly, so they have they um, the they have a very high metabolism. They have a high body temperature, so they have evolved to have these different viruses that do not kill them, but they the viruses have evolved to live at very high temperatures. Bats are very mobile. They're communal. They live in large groups, so they can really spread viruses um, amongst themselves and then go out into the world. Um, you know, and we, there are the theories of how this, you know, even um, COVID spread. But there are a lot of infectious diseases that have, for example, fruit-eating bats or bats that um, are vampire bats that will go to livestock, infect the livestock, and then the people eat the livestock. So um, a lot of the uh, papers that I was reading that was really looking at the virology was they would end by saying, and... We need to know where people come in contact with these bats or with the wildlife, and we need to identify the areas of land use change. And I thought, we do that. We can do that. We can identify where um, development is happening in the Amazon, for example. Where are the areas that have the highest probability of these new viruses emerging and crossing over to people? So. Um, uh, the world of infectious disease needs your um, your knowledge and your research in doing this in the future. Cheers, ma'am. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Thank you so much. Uh, we can't take any more questions because we have already crossed our time limit with this so engrossing and wonderful enlightening lecture that we have received from you ma'am. I'm really thankful and with such kind of lectures we used to realize that how, how powerful GI science is to analyze such a variety of problems of our earth surface. Yes. And yeah. So with this I would like to end this session. I'm really thankful to Dr. Nathan and to all my esteemed colleagues and my dear students uh, for this wonderful session. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I, I know you have reached out to ISPRS. 
in yeah. your, some of your other lectures. Um, uh, and I would just recommend everybody follow the activities of ISPRS and the summer schools. And there's a lot of, um, there's a, a student consortium you could become involved in. So um, I think and in India is a very um, important part of ISPRS, the Indian Remote Sensing Society. So um, I hope that all of you would be able to take advantage of that in the future as well. Definitely. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> Have a good day and good night to all my Indian friends. Yes, thank you for staying Bye. up late. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.